to Wisher Old Parish Church, those of us that are here in person in the sanctuary, or if you're watching later on online. I'm no wheel. Yes, I was up last night. No more details, no more person. So if you see me sitting down, that's why. And I've got a stair back too. Eh? Let's just think of all those lovely ailments that uh, those of us who reach a certain age suffer from. And thank, thank the Lord that we are here in church today, sharing in God's word and sharing in his message. Let's just have a moment of quiet before we begin our worship this morning. The book of Matthew calls us to worship today. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they came together and one of them, a teacher of the law, tried to trap him with a question. Teacher, he asked, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And the greatest and most important commandment, the second most important commandment is like this. Love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law of Moses and the teachings of the prophets depend upon these two commandments. Let's join in worshiping God this morning as we sing him 251, I the Lord of Sea and Sky. <laughs>
will hold your people in my heart. We hold the word of the Lord in our hearts today. We join our hearts in prayer. Let's join our hearts in prayer now. Lord, we gather in worship today to seek and experience thy holy presence, to be filled with your light and love in a world that often seems purposeless and empty. Lord, we seek the sense of the divine. Let us marvel at thy creation with the many patterns and shapes and colors that foster a tapestry of wonder. Lord, we give thanks for the diversity of nature, from the smallest of bugs and microbes to the awesome views of the fjord and the complexity of the rainforest. Living God, may we appreciate the beauty of our own gardens, the spaciousness of our local parks, cherishing the part that we too can play in stewarding the environment and in being ethical in the choices that we make in our lifestyle. For, Lord, out of darkness, you are light. Lead us to be good citizens of this planet and cherish it. Living God, lift any weariness, dispel any doubt, contain any anxiety, for you are the living water. Refresh our spirits each hour. Refresh us with the warmth of the sun's rays, with the playfulness of words and songs, in the sharing of laughter and amusement with friends and family this summer. Forgive us, Lord, when we forget and omit your presence, for you are the breath of life, the gateway to sanctuary. You are the true vine, whose roots are deep in the well of faith. For Jesus gave us these words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Keep us, Lord, on the right moral pathway. Support us when we tire. Gently nudge us when we fall asleep in our faith. And walk hand in hand with us when we are facing struggles and in pain. Lord, in this moment of quiet, we bring to you our own thoughts and prayers. Gather these in our hearts as we join together in prayer, saying the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Over the last few weeks, we've been having a, a a little bit of fun with our, a few quizzes, and I thought before we have our, our joint service, we'd have our, our, our last quiz, and I thought, oh well, we, we, we had finding God in nature, finding God in plants, finding God in the seasons last, year, uh, last week, but sometimes we can only glimpse what God is like. And sometimes when we read a story in Scripture, we really only get a silhouette of the divine, of the holy. We just, get, we, just get, we just get a glimpse of what God is like in the stories that we share. And we've, we've been sharing uh, a number of stories from Matthew's Gospel this month. So anyway, I'm going to give you a silhouette... And I want you to identify who the silhouette is. Some of them are dead easy and some some of them are a little bit tricky. And then I want you to kind of think of what quality the silhouette of that person would give to us. And then we'll link that to the qualities of God. So 
The first one is you'll see a silhouette of a character, name the character, then think of what qualities they might have. So here's the first character. Uh, a wee bit of a clue. Da 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 da. Yeah, who is it? Alfred Hitchcock. Now, when you think of Alfred Hitchcock, what's the first word that comes into your head? Sorry? Horror. Horror, okay. Psycho. Psycho, okay. Any other words? Birds. Birds, yes, that's a good one. I thought of the word mystery. I don't know if you've got Sky Arts, they still show Alfred Hitchcock's uh, half hour on that. And sometimes God is a mystery, and sometimes Alfred Hitchcock was a bit of an enigma, a bit of a mystery. Here's, here's the next silhouette. Who's this? Churchill. Churchill. It's, easy, it's dead easy this way. I thought I'd just make the quizzes just that way. So what do you think of? What, what one word comes into your head when you think of Sir Winston Churchill? War? Power. Sorry? Power. Power. Cigars. Cigars, okay. <laughs> this is all very superficial. Go a bit deeper, a bit deeper. <coughs> Any others? Strength. Strength, right, okay. So that's near the one I've got. I've got courage. <laughs> Sir Winston Churchill had an incredible, I mean, he was a very, very complex, complex human being. If you've read a biography or seen any films of him, Hitchcock had the mystery. God is a mystery. But God is about, about courage, facing life with courage. And whatever your political opinion and whatever you think of Churchill, he faced these big historical situations of our nature, of our nation, with courage. Here's another well-known person. Two images. Who's this? So, now, 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 remember this is being taped. Okay, so what word do you think of when you think of, of Trump? He or die. There we go. Any others? Yes. Sorry? Pardon? Jail. Okay. I, I'll not come in on that one. But that's a good one. Okay. Think, think of something that recently happened to, to uh, Trump. The assassination, yes, that's right. Well, he claimed, and I said at the beginning of last week's service, he claimed to be saved by God. There you go. You, did, you weren't expecting that one, were you? You were more expecting jail, weren't you? And uh, here died. So mystery, courage, salvation. Who's this? Bit more tricky, eh? Who do you think it is, Louise? I thought it was maybe Starmer. No, it's not Starmer. Barack Obama, that's right. So is there one word that Barack Obama used, think back many, many years to when he was on the election trail, and there was one word that he kept on using in all of his speeches? No? The word, not unity, no, no, but that's a very good word. No, it wasn't faith, pardon me. It wasn't peace, no, you're, you're getting closer. It was hope. Barack Obama just kept on saying, I want to bring the nation hope. Mystery, courage, salvation, hope. Who's this? There's one feature which gives it away. No, oh, no, that's a very good guess, but it's not Poirot, no. But you've got the feature. <laughs> not Gaudi, but you're, you're in the right area. Salvador Dali, very, very well done, ten, 10 out of 10. And when you think of Salvador Dali, what do you think of? Painting, Painting, Painting yes. Faith. Sorry? Faith. Oh, faith, okay. I was thinking of creativity. If you've ever seen any of Salvador Dali's paintings, they are incredibly creative. He was a very, very odd person, but creativity was certainly going on in his. So we've got mystery, courage, salvation, hope, creativity. Here's a bit of an easier one. Oh, yes. Mary Poppins, what do you think of? Burst into song. No, not supercalifragilistic. Think of the other one. 
No, feed the birds. You're, you're making this too difficult. What's the most famous one? Spoonful of sugar. There, there, there you go. Someone that makes the world go right. I know she's a fictitious character, but God is there to make the world go right. A bit more of a tricky one. Scrooge? Yes, well, that's right. It's not really tricky. It's actually St. Nicholas, Santa Claus. What would somebody younger think of when they think of Santa Claus? Present. Well, it, 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 they've given you the answer. Gifts. God gives us a great gift. The great gift of present. Okay. We're near the end. Trifle more tricky. It is a dove, yes. Say to me. It is. Give her a wee clap there. It is the Holy Spirit, yes. Well done. So there's two aspects of the Holy Spirit that that silhouette shows. I think somebody said it. What does it look like? Fire. Fire. Thank you. Give another round of applause to Nelson. There we go. Um, and so fire and. What's the Holy Spirit within us? Peace. Yes, peace and love, that's, the, that's right. So all these silhouettes are there to give us a glimpse of God. Mystery, courage, salvation, hope, creativity, that spoonful of sugar that we all need. Gifts, fire and love. And they are they're all wrapped up in the silhouette of our Lord Jesus Christ. To every, every week we come here to learn about, to share, to worship, but above all, to experience the love of Jesus in our hearts. Let's sing now. They who wait upon the Lord. It's a nice gentle, gentle one, and we're going to sing it through twice. I think it is one that we know, but do you want to, oh, it's the one that we may shake in our head. So let's hear, hear, the, hear the tune, and we'll join and sing it through twice. Join and wait upon the Lord. <coughs> and wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength and mount on eagles' wings. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength on eagles' wings. They will run, they will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Those who hope is in the Lord shall renew their strength. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength and mount on eagles' wings. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew Mount on eagle's wings That wait upon the Lord Shall renew their strength And mount on eagle's wings They that wait upon the Lord Shall renew their strength Mount on eagle's wings They will run, they will run And not grow weary they will walk and not be faint. Those whose hope is in the Lord 
shall renew their strength. that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, and mount on their eagles' wings. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, and mount on eagles' wings. And I guess. Guarantee you'll be humming that little tune all day today. Well, well, we shall have it again in a few weeks' time and begin to pick. It is a very lovely, reflective one. Thank you to me for, for playing. Our scripture passages continue, and uh, Angus today is going to close our series of passages from Matthew's Gospel, and you'll read from Matthew chapter 21. Parable of the Tenants of the Vineyard. Listen to another parable, Jesus said. There was once a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a hole for a wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard out to tenants and left home on a trip. When the time came to gather in the grapes, he sent his slaves to the tenants to receive his share of the harvest. The tenants grabbed his slaves, his slaves, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again the man sent other slaves, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. Surely they will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the owner's son. Come on, let's kill him and we will get his property. So they grabbed him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants, Jesus asked. He will certainly kill those evil men, they answered, and rent the vineyard out to the other tenants, who will give him his share of the harvest at the right time. Jesus said to them, Have you heard... But haven't you ever read what the scriptures say? The stone which the builders reject as worthless turned out to be the most important of all. This was done by the Lord. What a wonderful sight <coughs> it is. And so I tell you, added Jesus, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce the proper fruits. The chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables and knew that he was talking about them. So they tried to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowds who considered Jesus to be a prophet. Amen. May God add his blessing to us reading of his holy word. Thank you, Angus. We now join in singing a more familiar hymn to many in 229 we plow the fields and scatter
And now may the words of my mouth and the dedication of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. Amen. We all would like luxury without expense, pleasure without calories, security without a password. The advert says we're building a world where anyone can safely use any technology powered by their identity. We're building a world where anyone can safely use any technology powered by their identity. And the advert goes on to say that this is a world identity company. Well, it's promising you the moon, isn't it? And it says you'll be able to function with complete security. You'll have better costs, you'll be better off, and you'll be part of a global identity. Once upon a time, it was the church that provided the global identity of the world. Certainly of the, the known world. If you look at the, 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 the bits in dark red is our very, very Christian countries. The bits in kind of pale red are, are, less, are less Christian, but still categorized as Christian countries. So you see that something like two-thirds of the world, uh, or of the known world, the structure and identity of society was provided and grounded in God. The old-time entertainer, Max Bygraves. Now, there's one for the kids, eh? And Max's catchphrase, he would put his hands out and he would go, let me tell you a story. Implying that somehow the story wasn't true. I'm going to tell you a story that amuses you. I'm going to tell you a story that tickles your fancy. Something that's, that's, that's made up. And it's hard to get away from that interpretation when I say to you, I'm going to tell you a story. A story about world identity. Jesus spoke in stories or parables in order to, to shape the identity of the people who were listening to them. In order to open their imaginations and cause that, that creativity. And most of the parables have one of two expressions. The kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like this. It meant the same thing. There wasn't, there wasn't a difference between the kingdom on earth and the kingdom of heaven. Jesus wanted the kingdoms of God to be the same. Let me tell you a story. And so he entices his listeners, us, about a story about a group of vine dressers who not only refuse and don't pay up their dues, but they, they want to abuse the absent owner of the vineyard. And they go on to, first of all, insult them. And then the servants that are sent by the owner, they maltreat them. And then they even murder successive messengers who the owner sends on his behalf. Just think if it was a midsummer murder, it would be a really enticing story. It's got a great plot. It's got characters who we all sympathize with or who we think, you're going to be the next victim. And the climax of the story of the vineyard is, of course, where the heir is sent to the vineyard. And they kill the beloved son of the owner. Now, as Jesus would be sitting there telling the people the story, it would have been full of drama, full of twists, full of iniquity, crime linked with evil cells. In other words, it would have been a, a true life drama. Would that have been how the people heard that story? They would have known that story because that story is in Isaiah chapter 5. 
Jesus was retelling a story that most of the listeners would already have known. They would know that Israel was described by Isaiah as a beautiful vineyard. And the purpose of Isaiah's story, just as the purpose of Jesus' story, was to invite the people of Israel to make a judgment upon themselves. The vineyard of the story is Israel. The owner of the story is God. The fruit of the story is the behavior of the economics and the justice of Israel at that time. So when we think of of other countries' identity, when we think of of other countries' stories, what do we think of? If if I say to you, think think about Ireland, if you think about Ireland, what do you think about? You think about the green shamrock. You think about the Blarney Stone and the Rolling Hills. Or if you think about what's the, what's the identity of Italy? Many of us have been in, to Italy on holiday. Italy, great operatic singers. Pizza and pasta. Venetian gondolas. Or what about Norway? There, there, there are some of us, again, have been to Norway. Great forests, fjords, the northern lights. <coughs> What's the identity of, of Britain? Is it Tower Bridge? Is it the White Cliffs of Dover? Let's throw it out to you. What's Scotland's identity? Nessie. If you were... Sorry? Nessie. Nessie, okay. <laughs> I'm a believer. Yes, I've been to Loch Ness. So there's a lot of darkness underneath there. Any other parts of our identity? What what would we say about Scotland? Scenery. Scenery, yes. Beautiful country. Anything else? Bagpipes. Bagpipes? Welcoming people. people. Anything else? Whiskey. Sorry? Whiskey. Whiskey, Whiskey. yes, that's right. (laughs) I've not touched that yet, Jonas, but I'm leaving it for a special occasion. So everybody has an identity. We have a global identity. We have a bit of a cliched identity, but we have the identity. And so the symbolism of this well-known story for the people of Israel was all about identity. Who are you? But not just who are you, who are you in relation to God, in relation to God's world, God's creation? And in Isaiah's story, just as in Jesus' story, there is a watchtower. And the watchtower was the temple. In the story, there are a fence has made round the vineyard. That was the religious barriers that the temple structure threw up to God. Because remember, the temple originally was a sanctuary. The place where people could experience the divine, experience God, was very important of them. They had the Ark of the Covenant, then it was based in Jerusalem, then they built a temple around it. We still don't know whether the Ark of the Covenant, which could have been the Ten Commandments, were within that box. We don't know, we just kind of imagine that that's part of the mystery. And here in the story, the tenant farmers are the priests and the scribes. And of course, the messengers in Isaiah's story are the prophets. And we know that the religious authorities killed some of the prophets. And then finally, the end of Isaiah's story, the heir and the beloved son is, of course, the Messiah. And when Jesus is telling it, he's saying, it's me. He's predicting his own death. And we hear at the end of the story that they recognize that, that the scribes and the Pharisees recognize themselves and they want to kill him, they want to take him, but they're too frightened because of the crowd. And so the Jewish people knew that their global identity, once the Messiah came, they would have a better life. So it was a good story. It was a good news story. It was a story that they they loved, they looked forward to. And so the promise of the company advert is for security, economic advantage, a better life in a digital world. And that's what we live in today. We live in that 
digital world. And we want to be safe in the digital world. Or so I thought until two weeks ago. When we were buying our puppy, I got scammed by fraudsters. Fraudsters who had a legitimate bank account. Fraudsters who had a fake address that seemed plausible. And above all, they had a gullible and willing volunteer. But something inside me didn't send all my information. They wanted to steal my identity. They wanted to get my bank account, wanted to get my signature, wanted to get lots of things about me so they could take over my wealth and my income. Fortunately, my bank spotted it and kept me safe. Did the listeners listening to Jesus' story think it was a scam? It was just a tale of increase, a tale of, of crime based on Isaiah's story. But in the middle of the story, in the middle of the passage Angus read for us, Jesus does the classic crime denouement. That means the end of the story. At the end of the story, he turns to his audience and say, right, what do you think the punishment should be for this crime? What should happen to the criminals of this story? He throws the question out. He captures their imagination. And of course, the natural human response is, punish them. That's our natural response when we hear about a, a crime. We want justice. We want it punished. But Jesus is inviting his disciples and us to go just a little bit deeper in our response. And in Matthew's telling of the story and in Luke's telling of the story, we have the famous quote, the stone that the builders rejected turned out to be the most important of all. And in some translations, it, it says, has become the cornerstone. For this building to stand up, for any building to stand up, we need a cornerstone. We need a foundation. And builders tell you, when you take out the cornerstone, it falls down. And that was what Jesus was trying to say to his listeners and is saying to us. Here's a quote about that global company from a CEO. The company ticked every box for us. It's the glue that holds the crucial elements of our business together. Jesus is that cornerstone. Jesus is that glue that holds everything that we hold dear together. So as the global identity of the world becomes digital, as the world changes and the church no longer is that glue, can we still offer to people that Jesus is the cornerstone, that Jesus is the glue? As it said, by the Lord had been this done, it is the wonderful in our eyes. That was the end of the quote. And so it was that the priests and the scribes realized that Jesus was speaking about their identity. Just as Isaiah's prediction had been speaking about the nation of Israel, and the priests and the scribes wanted to chase him. If we look back to that, world, to, to that map of the world, we know that Christianity is, is getting chased. Jesus is still getting chased. But they feared him. They feared because the crowd recognized him as a prophet. So as we experience that silhouette of Jesus, as we glimpse from the story of Matthew, as we glimpse from the story that Jesus has told us about the graceful disciple, about the sacrifice needed in discipleship, and above all, about the drawing near of our own identity to that of Jesus Christ. 
Amen. And we give thanks for the stories of Jesus. In this time of quiet, let us all pray. Gracious Father, as we look out on a broken world, we pray for those who are disempowered and at the mercy of those stronger than them. We ask for your, information, your intervention as the God who defends the righteous, sustains those who fall, raises up all who are bowed down and brings down the wicked. Will you intervene on behalf of those who love you and those who are broken and fallen? We thank you for the example of leadership we see in Jesus and ask that in any of the spheres of life where we have leadership responsibilities, we will act with kindness, compassion and grace. Make us reflections of your grace and mercy. Fill us with your spirit that we may be filled with loving kindness and that by living in the resurrection power of the risen Lord, we may also, like you, be slow to anger and gentle towards others. We pray that where leaders are using their position and authority to crush and exploit the weak and poor, that you would raise up men and women of faith and integrity who can speak and act on behalf of the voiceless. Show us also where our lives intersect with the powerless and the purchases we make, the investments we hold, the effects of choices we make on the climate. Make us people of action who make this world a better place. At this time of uncertainty in the church, we pray for all ministers and elders and indeed members that they may discern their call and wish for a mission church reaching out to the poor, the hungry, the lonely, and the disadvantaged. We remember with grace and compassion 
those of our number and others known to us who are ill or facing tests and diagnosis before treatment. Grant them peace of mind in these uncertain times. We hold in our prayers the bereaved, and especially at this time, may we encircle the family of our dear friend David Buchanan with that bond of Christian love and comfort. May they all be sustained by the memory of a faithful servant to this church. All this, together with the silent prayers of our heart, we commit to Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Tom. And now the offering shall be received. invite God's blessing upon these gifts. Lord God, we adore thee. Come to worship and lay our lives before thee, giving thanks and praise for our life and faith in Jesus. Let us love thee and our neighbor, and by hearing thy word, grow in faith as we offer ourselves unto thee. Lord, may we tell that story, and may that story live on in us. Amen. Uh, good morning, friends, and as always, welcome to your service, and a special welcome to any visitors sharing time with us this morning. Uh, I do hope that we've all experienced true fellowship through this common worship, whether we're present here in church or we'll be watching later today on the webcast. Please take time, those that are here, to share in wider fellowship in the hall following the service. As always, a thanks to Keith for the conduct of worship and that timely reminder that Jesus is a cornerstone of our lives. Also to May for leading our worship at the organ, to Angus for his reading, the technical team May for the pre preparation of the PowerPoint, to Neil and Marco at the recording desk, and their work later today in uploading it. During the month of August, we will be joint, holding joint services with the other churches in our cluster area in the southern part of the attestation area. The full details are shown in the order of service, and we can now confirm that uh, the services all start at 11 a.m., so that's 11 a.m. for our joint services. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, all our members continue to make good progress following illness. In fact, I visited uh, Anne Struthers on Wednesday, and she asked to be kindly remembered to them. Uh, she's had one cataract operation and she's waiting for the other one. It's a difference in night and day. She's delighted. However, we learned just uh, early last week that Jim Vincent, a member of our choir, has been admitted to hospital. So as always, we would ask for your continuing prayers for those and, and improvement for those who are ill or, or in hospital. On a much brighter note, congratulations go to Nettie Majimsey who celebrated her birthday yesterday. I did tell you so that you wouldn't be embarrassed, but many congratulations and best wishes, Nettie. And a reminder that uh, David... Ah. Ah. Uh, a reminder that David Buchanan's funeral service will be held here from the church on Wednesday of this week at 11 a.m. and thereafter to Holytown Crematorium at 12.30. And at this time, as always, we would hold Myrtle Hazel, David, Ian, and the wider and extended family in their prayers at this time. And the usual, stay safe, stay calm, stay praying, and may God bless you all. Thank you, Tom. 
we close our service with him 160 praise my soul the king of heaven <laughs> serve the Lord. And we ask for the blessing in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.